Zoom and teaches at Hilldale College as well as a couple other colleges nearby. And um, he's agreed to talk to us today about acoustics. Thank you. Well, uh, acoustics basically started when Pythagoras walked by uh, a hammersmith shop and was listening to the, uh, the hammer uh, on the anvils and uh, was hearing the pitches created by these, uh, these, these hammers on the anvil and uh, was fascinated that the pleasant, there were sometimes pleasant intervals between one hammer and another hammer and unpleasant uh, sounds from one hammer to the next. And he uh, decided to study it and found that the pleasant one, the pleasant sounds basically came from hammers that had uh, a property of whole number ratios to one another. And the science of acoustics was basically born from that, that moment on. Um, this idea of ratios translates very well to the strings in that uh, the harmonics that we have on our string instruments is um, basically a, a whole number division or fractions of the string instrument, or of the strings itself. So if you cut the string in half, you'll get an octave. If you cut the string into a third, you get an octave and a fifth. Cut the string into a fourth or an octave or a half of a half, you'll get again another <coughs> octave and so forth. Uh, this uh, division of the strings is uh, partly in, in responsible for what we would call the just intonation system um, and also the Pythagoras intonation system. Both are derived from this uh, uh, division of the string and whole number fractions of uh, of the fundamental, of the first, first tone. The, um, the harmonics uh, that I would be basically concerned with uh, in string instruments, um, I would want to make sure that uh, in this lecture that you would know, one, how they're played, two, where they are, uh, and three, hopefully, how they're written, uh, so that when you do see them and or check them, uh, you know how to play them from first go. Uh, so the, uh, I guess I'll de demonstrate that first. The first set of harmonics that you've probably seen uh, are the ones used uh, for tuning an instrument. Uh, the half string harmonic. And this harmonic uh, of the third. The half string harmonic gives you, again, the octave. The half, and the harmonic at the third gives you an and a fifth. Since the strings are tuned to a fifth, if I cut the higher string in half and the lower string in a third, if the instrument's in tune, I should in fact get the same pitch. And a lot of students use this as their first method of tuning to get those two to match. They would know then the bottom string is in tune keep working their way down until finally they get to the last string. This is uh, the first introduction to harmonics that you have. Now, I've cut the string into a third at this point. Uh, I've basically created uh, a nodal point or a point that doesn't want to vibrate by tap touching my finger very lightly on the string. Same thing is said for cutting the string in half. I've created a nodal point um, by cutting the string into very even fractions. One over two, one over three. Now, this one over three, there's another place that I can also touch the string to get this harmonic to happen. And it's at the, I guess you would say, two thirds point. But, uh, Physics doesn't really care which end you start at, you know, so as long as, you know, you're starting at either at the bridge or the nut, uh, the fractions work out exactly the same. I'm, I'm going exactly the same distance here as I am here, uh, in terms of actual inches, not in terms of actual pitch, obviously. Uh, if I cut then the string into a fourth, I can get that 
same point. But if I cut the string out, you know, into one fourth or three fourths, I can get the same harmonic. But if I cut it into two fourths, that's the same as one over two, and the harmonics love going to the lowest common fracture. So instead of hearing this pitch, I hear that pitch. Now, I can touch both points and still get that same crack, that same harmonic to speak. Basically because this nodal point is a point on the string that doesn't actually vibrate. Uh, it's difficult to see on this, um, but hopefully uh, we can get it to see a little bit better here. Um, this is an oscillating string and it has uh, a nodal point at each end, but we also have a nodal point here where I can touch the string, a nodal point here, and a nodal point here. So I've cut the string into one, two, three, four parts. So this, you know, this is now vibrating at about 39 and a third. If I divided that, you know, um, that would be, what's that? I'm trying to figure out what that is. One, two, three, four. Um, it's four times the frequency of the fundamental. Okay, so I would take this number 39, um, and I guess the fundamental would be you know, one fourth of that, so something just under 10, definitely over 9, in order to get that. If I wanted to change uh, that, let's see, if it's just over 9, if I move it down to like 20, 27, oh, this is really hyper sensitive. There we have three, and I'm at 29, so same sort of thing that we're seeing here. Uh, again, a nodal point here where I can touch the string, and that's where the harmonic would have been created. A nodal point here where I would have created, this would have created an octave and a fifth because I've divided the string into three parts. Okay? Um, hopefully that makes it a little clearer to see what's actually happening with the strings. Um, the, Next harmonic then up um, would be cutting the string into five parts and and again there are you know uh, four nodal points plus these plus the ends here too so that the string is vibrating in five parts here. This gives me two octaves and a major third above excuse me above the fundamental pitch. Um, these are the th three, uh, the most uh, important ones that we have to work with here. Um, this harmonic gives a yeah, major, uh, major third above two octaves. So we have uh, the fundamental, the octave, uh, basically the same pitch, two octaves and a fifth, a new tone that's created when we cut the string into thirds. Two octaves, which is the same thing as the fundamental, and then finally two octaves and a major third. So here's our our new third note. This is the open A, the octave and a fifth gives us the E. Two octaves and a third gives us the C sharp, A C sharp E. This is how the major chord was created, invented, discovered. Uh, it was invented and discovered basically through these harmonic um, overtones, if you will, of the instrument itself. Um, now, this this uh, octave, or I'm sorry, this division of of the uh, um, string, cutting it into smaller and smaller segments of it, is is also one of the ways that we've also figured out how to create. Uh, the scale within the system and how every uh, scalar system in the world has also uh, invented itself from these divisions in one way or another. Western music has divide, decided to divide this, this octave into 12 equal parts um, and has done it in a very uh, somewhat complicated manner, um, but basically based off of this major triad that we have from from the overtone series. Um, 
the Chinese system uh, basically used what we call a Pythagorean tuning system, and they just kept taking a fifth and cutting, you know, um, taking a string, cutting it into two thirds, which is the original length, and getting a fifth above that, cutting that into two um, two thirds. And getting the next note B, taking that, cutting it into two fifths, getting it so you get an F sharp, uh, until they finally had five tones that they, that they wanted for their pentatonic scale. Um, if you keep going in that system of the pentatonic, um, or I'm sorry, uh, Pythagorean fifths tuning system, you eventually will get all 12 tones that we have in our system as well. Now, the problem with that system, um, and, and uh, I'm not saying you know, that it's a bad system as a result of it, each system actually has its, its inherent problems uh, in it, and I'll hopefully we'll explain a little bit as to why that is. But the Pythagorean system, uh, I'm cutting the string into a third. So this uh, note is three halves times three halves. Um, the length of the original. No, I'm sorry. It's. I always get this math. It's two thirds. Thank you. It's two thirds the original length of of the string. Um, if I keep cutting something again by two thirds and two thirds and two thirds and two thirds, do that twelve times. Uh, I obviously will have. 12 to this, or 2 to this 12th, divided by 3 to the 12th. Um, this, uh, because of that 3 on the bottom, is going to make it absolutely impossible for it to actually come out to a perfectly even number at the end. Um, with that tuning of, of, of this fits so many times, I'll, uh, 12 times, I'll actually get 7 octaves. Uh, and I think the number comes out to be 129.7 uh, something. If I take seven octaves, two to the seventh, I can end up with 128. So the numbers, although very, very close, um, 128 compared to 129 with some change, um, still doesn't actually line up. And the same is true with almost every system that we have. They're all very, very close to each other, but they have um, distinct qualities that make them mathematically um, inconsistent or uh, um, where we have to sort of fudge them around a little bit. Um, so the Pythagorean system, as a result uh, of these fifths um, going out, ends up having what we call very wide, wide intervals, wide fifths, um, and we end up also with, uh, which we don't really mind too much, it, it's actually very quite quite close, it ends up being um, very close to a pure uh, tuning system. Well, it is actually a pure tuning system. Um, but when you get to the major third, it gets a little uh, a little scary, a little, a little wild. A little wild. Uh, so the tuning system that I prefer uh, is the, what I call a just intonation system. Uh, and uh, it basically uses the harmonics of the instrument itself. Um, so I basically take that fifth and use it and I use that third. Now the problem with this third though, uh, compared with uh, equal temperament and with the Pythagorean uh, system, is that it's really low. The uh, Pythagorean third is, is very high and the, but likewise as well this um, this major, this major third is really quite low to the ear. The reason why, though, I like it, it doesn't create uh, any beats or um, dissonances within the ear of, of all the harmonics of the chords I'm trying to create. Um, so, creating a major chord on A, on A, A, C sharp, E, um, the third in that chord will be a little low compared to what we would call an equal temperament or Pythagorean uh, temperament. But 
C-sharp that I would play would match the C-sharp that would be in the A as well. And that kind of tuning would then prevent any kind of beats from happening. Now, beat is when two notes that are very close to each other are played simultaneously, but not quite. You hear this pitch very fine. You hear that pitch very fine. When they're played together, you get in a third combination of this wah, 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 wah. And musicians call this a beat. Uh, some physicists call this a difference pattern. Uh, and basically what's happening is the two uh, sound sources are playing, um, adding and contracting to each other uh, very quickly and determined by <coughs> the number of, of cycles that each one is playing. So this A is basically at uh, 220. And if I play something that's definitely below 220, the number of beats that I hear is going to exactly tell me how many cycles per second I'm off from that A. So if Oh, yes, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, the tuner that we have, uh, in, on most tuners, you'll see a, a meter and whatnot, and it, it, then you'll see these little numbers 10, 20, 50, you know, 50 on one side, 50 on the other side. Uh, uh, these are uh, scent divisions of a beat, or I'm sorry, of, uh, of a semitone. There are 100 scents from one semitone the next semitone, and basically it has taken the, um, the number of cycles of one pitch and the number of cycles of the second pitch and divided that into 100 parts, and that is what would create a semitone, or I'm sorry, a set. Um, the acoustic comma consistently keeps falling for this major third at 14 cents below the equal temperament that you see on most tuning systems. Uh, the perfect fifth 
is two cents above that. It's such a small amount again. The gear would have to have a very, very hard time carrying the difference. Yeah. So uh, for most tuning systems, getting the, the root of the cord and the fifth of the cord uh, perfectly straight up on a tuner, and you'll be all right. But it's the third that always seems to determine how your ear is going to work on this. Uh, now the ear is designed, um, like I said, in this just in today's system. It likes to find the, the um, systems that work uh, the most pleasing for the ear. And I think this is probably what uh, Mr. Pythagoras uh, heard when he was going by the, the Hammersmith Challenge, was uh, something that his ear was actually able to create uh, a simple wave uh, in his eardrum without having to do uh, creating all these different patterns uh, of the notes that he was hearing uh, with these hammers. Um, any questions so far? No? Okay. So, uh, you said that A was turning in cycles. How does that relate to the 430 hertz? Um, the A, okay, so this A is an octave lower than the normal tuning A from an oboe or a violin. And you said that A is, up, is 440, right? Well, the 440, if you cut it in half, gives you 220. <coughs> Every octave is related to the next octave by you know, doubling or having that number, depending upon which direction you go. So if I wanted to go and find this A, I would have to have this again. So that would tell me this A is 110. If I wanted to go find the A that's on the first harmonic, the half string harmonic on the A string, I would double 440 to get 880 cycles per second, or 880 hertz. And that's something like that. What that 29 is saying is I'm vibrating this string at 29 cycles per second. Um, and that gave me, what was it, 3? Yeah. And then at 39 point something, it gave me 4. Um, so that basically told me this string likes I'm vibrating at about 9. Somewhere between 9 and 9. Um, okay. Um, let's see. That is the uh, most basic part of it. It gets uh, really kind of complicated after this and works better in demonstrations almost uh, in smaller groups. Um, but, um, let's see, I'm not sure where I was going to go from here. Yes. Do I have it here? Sorry. Uh, I know it's a bit early, but. Uh, That's fine if you just want to do it right here. Did you guys bring your instruments? Do we have. A certain number of violins. <laughs> How many violins do we have? Okay. One. Okay. Violas. Okay, we have two violins, two violas, cello. Two cellos. Two cellos. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. Um, why don't we do them? Okay, let's break up into groups. So one violin, one viola, one cello. Or, I'm sorry, the violin and viola together. Viola. And yeah. then cellos. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> For people who are on the broadcast, um, we're going to post the handout as well as a list of activities that we did if you want to participate at home later. We'll also be posting the video in about two weeks, so you can watch for that on the website, and that'll be available then. Thanks for watching. It's designed to help you play in two, uh, especially in this just intonation system. And the system that is going to help you is called sympathetic vibrations. Now, every object has a sympathetic vibration, a frequency that it wants to vibrate at. Most objects, like this shelf, the wall, the glass, uh, are so thick or heavy um, or built up of composite materials that 
uh, it won't want to vibrate or it has too many frequencies that it can't vibrate at, so it ends up vibrating at none of them. Um, you've probably seen on cartoons uh, or maybe in some of the older movies where an opera singer would sing and someone's wine glass would break. This is an example of sympathetic vibration. It's not the fact that she's singing so loud, although that certainly does help. It's the fact that she's actually singing at the frequency of that wine glass. That wine glass then takes the frequency from the air, takes that energy from the air, and then begins to oscillate. Because the glass is a crystal form, it can only vibrate so far, you know, and then, you know, eventually it, it cracks because of the amount of energy. Now, the nice thing with our instruments is they're actually designed to want to vibrate. So there's going to be a lot of pitch available on our instruments uh, to vibrate. And you've probably experienced a lot of these already if you play on the violin or on the viola, third finger uh, on a string, the lower, the neck to take the string lower uh, will be buzzing and vibrating. And this is an example of um, synthetic vibrations. And we're going to use that system to help us play in tune because um, although it's much easier to hear these harmonics to actually hear that uh, on the cello and, and, the, uh, and probably the bass, uh, it, it's a little bit more difficult on the, on the violin and viola because the harmonics end up almost, almost and literally going outside of the hearing range. But it doesn't mean that the instrument act, isn't actually vibrating still. So although we can't hear it, we can actually be able to use it and check it. So uh, what I would suggest is. Um, Taking, for example, the third finger on your instrument, and um, when you place it down, then tap the string uh, that would be vibrating, and you should get a small clicking sound. As soon as you tap the string that's vibrating, uh, it no longer can contribute to the sound, and it will actually as well uh, stop vibrating as soon as you touch it. So, uh, let's see if I can give you a better example of three. That's me stopping the vibrating string, and that you know that clicking is um, what we're going for to help us. Because if I'm not playing, I'm not playing into. Don't hear it because it's not moving. Okay, so there's nothing for me to stop moving. Um, so there's that note. There's Thank you. 
quieter. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely quieter. Uh, if you're able to build that major chord on each string, uh, you basically have um, the four open strings. You have, you have a major third about those, um, and then the fifth as well about that. You pretty much cover eight out of twelve uh, of the tones that are in uh, in the twelve in the, in the, in the chromatic scale. So there's there's a lot that you probably will be able to hit in the piece that you're playing. You probably say, am I playing in tune? Am I not playing in tune? Um, that's uh, that's the system that uh, I'm grateful for, uh, Dr. Barry Ross. Um, for showing me uh, what he calls a uh, guide to exquisite intonation. Uh, there's, he's written two books, one for violins, one for violas, uh, on that subject and going through this very exercise. But essentially, this is uh, this is the method of, of getting the harmonics of the instrument and the sympathetic vibrations that the instrument wants to create uh, to help us play into without. Because as soon as, yeah, if you move just a tiny fraction away, all of a sudden. So it, it's a good guide for the, for the student who either you know, doesn't want to have it, or doesn't have one nearby, you know, or who just really just verify, and when I actually turn into the instrument, it will help the player play by telling them, yes, you are, you've got the note. No, you should tell that. It opens up and it produces quite a low third. Yes, it will create a low third. And it also has quite a range. It does. Um, and, uh, like I said, I'm mostly concerned with the major chords above uh, the strings. So it would be. Um, the second play doesn't come into it unless it ends up being the fifth or both. But we don't play always all these strings. Right. No, that's very, very true. Um, okay, so if I'm in. Um, if I'm in uh, G major, I'm playing um, the. Uh, I'll just do B natural. I hear not only that B off of my G string going, I'm actually also going to hear the F sharp going because the B that I'm playing also creates a harmonic series. B, G sharp, F sharp. It creates a major chord off of the tone that I'm playing. And so I can use those as well to help me find from these open strings. Okay, so I would use that B natural. If I played a B flat, there's no B flat string, uh, but I would use the third from that B flat. Get the D natural. So that helps me find D natural, you know, to find the B flat in tune with a D string. C natural, obviously on my instrument, then I would be able to play for a C. C sharp is the third. Of the A chord. Uh, D, I would say the natural is the D. E flat has a G, na G natural in its, um, in its major chord. So I would use the G natural of my open string. E, there are two of them. I can either use the third of the C, or I can use the fifth of the A. Now, here's where the uh, the just intonation system gets a little wobbly because this third is going to be a low E compared to a high third. And so then I had to, now I have to make a decision, okay, is the key I'm playing in closer to C major or closer to A major? And that's kind of the problem with the just intonation system is the fact that these notes, you're going to get more disparate notes. So you have to actually almost ask yourself, what key am I in? And is this actually, you know, if I'm playing in B major and I've got a, you know, a B flat in it or an A sharp, am I really going to want to use a, a tuning system that has an open D in it? Probably not. Probably not. So it, it does have some problems um, inherent in it. Um, they all do. Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> I've, I've found. Um, but yeah, there's um, there's really a note that you can hit if you can build a chord, a major chord off the note that you're playing, or um, and know the major chords of the instrument that you have, and utilizing those two chords and trying to find what's the common tone that I can play. Um, so check and see if I'm actually playing in tune. Now, unfortunately, you're playing on one of the strings, so sometimes the string you're checking is the one you're supposed to be playing. Um, that one I can't really help you out with too much, <laughs> other than playing it in a different area, getting that locked into your ear, and then you know, finding it on the original um, But there's hardly any hardly a note that you can um, not build this major chord off of the When I was finding it for myself, I was absolutely amazed. When I was like, oh my gosh. I, really, you know, I thought it was just, oh, yeah, my fourth finger, D, that's great. Oh, my second finger, C, okay, that's great. Then all of a sudden I played this first finger and I'm like, B, why? why, why there's no B on, this, on the instrument. Why is. Why is then I realized, oh, yeah. But then I realized the F sharp is also going that way. That's when I said, oh, that's when I finally figured, oh yeah, there's an F sharp with the harmonic note, harmonic series, the note I'm playing, getting these two to match. You know, um, getting one to vibrate sympathetically because of the, uh, the one that I'm playing on. And that was the exciting part of this one. It really got my hand up to the open up and play to this more exact communication. It also really trained the ear, the ear, it is as I play. And for cellists, this is the system what I call choke and check, and it's exactly the same system of using the sympathetic vibration. But because the notes, the harmonics are low enough, you can actually hear them while you're playing them once you've played them. So, like I said, we've all had that phenomenon. Where you play the note uh, an octave above the string, and you can hear the extra string vibrate. Um, if it, if, so the system I call choke and check. If you actually choke the string, so it can't contribute. What's left vibrating is the sympathetic vibration that's that's going on. You know, eventually, then because there's no energy being put into the system, it dies away. Uh, but I can use that. To say whether or not it's in tune, because if it's not, no matter how loud I play, you know, the instrument's like, I don't want to vibrate into it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not tuned to that note, you know, that exact frequency. So, yeah, it, it won't vibrate and it'll just, you know, be kind of like this. Um, unfortunately, yeah, you can't. Um, for this choke and check system, you can't choke the string while you're performing in you know, recital or whatnot. So how the heck are you going to know what the heck if you are playing in tune in the middle of a performance? This, this sympathetic vibration is actually going, if you're playing in tune, it's actually going on while you're playing the notes. So in training your ear to hear not only the note that you're playing, but the sympathetic vibrations that are going on around it um, is really not as complicated as I thought it would be. Um, it's really just a matter of hearing one note and then hearing what that note sounds like without that sympathetic vibration going on. So, for the cellist, I, um, yeah, for the cellist, I would say let's try the. Fourth finger, fourth finger D on the A string. And choke the string. Don't let it ring, because then that you're hearing the ring of the string that you're playing. But actually choke the string. Stop the bow. Incredibly 
eight cents then. <laughs> System does actually require the instruments to be in tune to start with. Swap is tune. Um, check your second. C, C natural on the A string. That would be C natural on the A string. Should hear, of course, that the you open know, C. This is two octaves above, so it, since it's a higher harmonic, it's going to be a lot weaker. Now, a higher harmonic than that, try your first finger on the, on the A string, B match. This is a. You hear that? That's your G, and hopefully your F sharp, ringing. Now this is the thing that I found really scary. Find that B. Find that B. Hear it? Okay. Keep it. Find your C natural. Don't let it ring. That's G. Yes. Hear it? A little flat. <laughs> the more in tune you get, yeah. the louder it becomes. You know, this is the first, and, what I call the first and second step of, of token check. So you got that? Now find, keep those two fingers. Now find your fourth finger D. You got it. Is your hand wider than? Yeah. Yeah. This is the thing I found with most students who don't use this system. They all of a sudden realize, oh my gosh, is that why to play in tune? Yeah. You've gotten to the point. It's like, well, this, you know, this is how wide it is. It's like, and then you, your hand goes a little uncomfortable. Can you just do a little bit like this and just <laughs> squeeze a little? That, that doesn't sound so bad. And then the ear gets used to that. And then you know, three weeks later, it's like, you know, I can't feel it. I'm still fine. Can you just close it up a little? And it keeps making it more comfortable, you know. But unfortunately, yeah, if the instrument's in tune, it'll tell you instantly, nope, can't vibrate to it, not in tune. Don't like it. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is the one part I did not like. It's good. this is fine. <laughs> um, but remember that B you're playing is a third from the open G. It's going to be quite low, which is why the hand is quite wide. Okay. If I were trying to play that B in tune with uh, Pythagorean fifth above the E above the A, it would be quite high. Um, again, this, this various systems, depending on what you use, is going to determine which one you're going to use. So if, for example, the violins are playing an open E and you're having the fifth of that chord, um, you have to play a very high. B in order to get that to be in tune with, um, with the violin key. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you're constantly making adjustments. The just intonation system, you're constantly making adjustments. You're depending on the chord and the key. You got your tune? Let's give it a try. Let's see what it is. Find that fourth finger D. Now, I want you to chuck it. That's it. Try it again. Here it's a little flat. Let me hear your open. Okay, now play your fourth finger. Good. Now choke that. No, I'm sorry, just the open. You play, the more energy you put into it, i.e., the louder you play, the more the harmonic will want to speak. This is especially helpful when you're trying to find the ones that are really way up. <laughs> um, like that B natural as well. Try and find the um, C natural. Is that correct? 
Empire, you heard a couple of them kind of bringing, and then I finally went to Hawk Shark, and it stopped bringing all together. Yes? No? Did everyone catch that? Hopefully? Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, it basically follows about a bell curve in terms of its, you know, how, if you're most in tune, that's the middle of the bell curve, it will play the loudest, you know, in that bell curve kind of set. The more out of tune you are, flat or sharp, the softer it goes until finally it disappears completely. This is what I call the first step on choking step. The second step is this tone will actually tries to go back to its original pitch that it wants to vibrate at, i.e. the one that's in tune. And it will bend in the direction from where you played to the one you should play. So if you're playing flat, it will do, it will get to this, the true pitch in one of two ways. It will either pop immediately, you know, from the note I'm playing, so you hear, you hear, you'll hear me play this one, I'll stop it, and it will ring at that oh. pitch. Or it will decay at the end of it into that. It usually decays when I'm very, very close, and it usually uh, pops when I'm that close at all. Okay? So. So this one tells me that I'm sharp because. Same. No, no, you've got a different, you got a lower end than I do. Mm -hmm. So, his, you know, if I play 
my instrument and got it to ring, it wouldn't pass on here right now. Hopefully when they are all tuned to 220, 440, yes, then, you know, my C would match, you know, her, you know any kind of resonating on my instrument would get the yield to resonate as well. I think it was the back of the instrument you said? Yeah. 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 Well, you, I, can, I can feel it all vibrating, but I can put my hand, like, not damp it, because I'm all pressing the fingertips. Fingertips, and you can feel shaking that much. Right. So, yeah, I guess that question relates a little bit to quality of instrument. I mean, the different it, instruments that have complete. much more resonance in the so the wood itself will be more resonant on the yeah. instrument. And the more of a crate, the less natural resonance that you get. And you get that you have to be more studious. I have another question. What about the falseness of students? I try to help some of my students tune, and I realize after I take their instrument into my hands that I just play the pitch, and it has a huge sag in it while playing the pitch, that makes it very difficult to tune. They, Virtually impossible. Right. Yeah. Okay, so it's, um, being yeah. able to be sensitive to my strings for a false. Yes. And there's, you know, sometimes there even brand new strings are all, they're all false. Right. The beauty to check uh, for a false. False string. Uh, when a string gets old, uh, the inner core of the string tends to lose lose its ability to um, hold that pitch. Um, the tension on the string, um, the, the inner core is designed to stay at you know, that tension and be able to keep it. Even though we add more tension by playing loud, we're actually pressing the string down a little bit more, so we're actually creating tension on that string. But it doesn't actually go up in pitch. The string is actually able to hold that pitch through the core. If the core loses that ability and takes that extra tension and says, Oh, you want to go sharp, you know, it will then actually bend in pitch the, sign of a the louder you play. So yes, if you want to if you want to test a string that's false, play a crescendo, a, 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 a wedge, a crescendo and a day crescendo. And if it's false, you'll hear no. If you hear that, then you're like, yeah, the instrument needs a new string. <laughs> okay? It can look fine, but yeah, that's the one test that I've, I found is without fail. Um, usually, you know, now that my ear is a little bit more in tune, um, I just get cranky every time I play my instrument because I can't hear those notes. So I'm like, God, everything sounds out of tune. Ah! You know, no matter where I put my finger, I'm like, I you know, the, the harmonics are all in just weird and abnormal places, and it, I just get really cranky. In the middle of the um, but yeah, then, you know, about you know, two days later, then I start, you know, like, I do that test, I'm like, oh, that's, that's why I'm in a bed. You know, I'm to go false. Um, but it, it's a great, it, it's, you know, it's, it's impossible to not hear uh, when the string goes false like that. And then go to your mom and say, look, it's bad, I can't play in tune with these, you know, and, and you'll be able to keep your ear a little bit um, stronger in pitch without having to have that falseness. Uh, the quality of the instruments, though, this is, this is another one that, you know, you can actually, uh, if these upper harmonics speak easier and clearer and louder on the better instruments. So when you're actually testing an instrument either to purchase um, or, you know, well, I guess to purchase and or to play, this is one of the tests I also use and get my students to use as well, is to have them test these harmonics, these, these sympathetic vibrations. If they speak clearer on one instrument than another, then you know this instrument wants to sing, wants to sing in tune. Generally, that's a good thing. <laughs> Wanted it to that actually you know, wants to, wants to play, wants to vibrate. Um, yeah, the course, the course of the instruments, the softer the vibrations are, um, so it gets a little bit harder to hear. So it's not impossible. You know, it's clear that you heard them as well. Yes, but I think mine probably a little clearer. Yeah, um, hoping my instrument might be a little bit more valuable in it or um, perhaps a little bit better. Um, yeah, that's the one thing that you can also test. Aside from just the normal qualities, is just the sympathetic vibration quality. Is it, can it actually produce those drums? 
you end up getting that crappy tone almost always it's you know or at least one of the possibilities is you you're actually trying to play on a point of the string that doesn't want to vibrate an anti-nodal point um, and yeah no matter how hard you play it ain't gonna speak. <laughs> you know it's just gonna sound like you know but I yeah, I just move the bow without moving this harmonic and I get it to speak, or I can get it to sound like crap. Hopefully, we'll want to do one of those things. So yeah, the placement of the bow is very important um, with respect to harmonics, especially if the high harmonics, you know, or false harmonics. Well, this, um, you know, passages of harmonics, and you wonder when you watch people play why it's not working, but... The second movement of the sense song, third concerto, okay. for example. Okay. Is it, it ends with this passage of a harmonic, Crazy high harmonics. harmonic arpeggios. It's like three lines long, and everybody holds their breath through it, which is already bad. I think they can't, you know, will one speak, of them will, will speak, speak, and then one speak. won't speak, and then one will speak, and, and I. I would, I would venture to find out where the nodal points are on the bridge for each of those notes, and then find out what's the pathway <laughs> between. You know, that's the straightest, because obviously you don't want to go like this throughout the concerto. Like, sure. Oh my gosh, she's having a fit, an <laughs> epileptic fit. Um, um, but something along that line, probably. At the very least, you would eliminate that possibility. Um, yeah, I'm certainly not, you know, the foremost expert on all the facts of the concerto. Sure, the thrush in the Bartok class, that's bad. Yeah. Bring up the chip of the you know, that yeah. double stop harmonics. So yeah, you, the main thing is yeah, you would, you want the bow to be on the antinodal point, um, getting it to actually you're adding the energy where the bow the string wants to be uh, with with the sound on the instrument. So you're getting the bow to move where the string wants to move. And for harmonics, that's on an antinodal point. This is sort of a maybe back to a very basic question. Oh, sure, absolutely. That's the, the interesting point that I always that I've learned from way back. If you have a first finger on a string, it's going to be in a different place when you play it with the open string above than when you play it with the open string, string below. Above, below. You have a fourth or a major sixth. Yes. And reconciling the two. I mean, they yes. are two different places. Yes. And this. how does that tie in with your um, presentation so today? Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I'm interested yes. to know just where, where you would find that first finger then in that case. The, uh, I'll start with the perfect fourth, because that's uh, an example of, uh, in the Pythagorean system, it's, it's uh, what's it, four to three? I wrote it down somewhere. Oh, three to two is the fourth. Four to three is the fourth, yeah. Um, uh, relation, so, you know, three quarters of the string length. Um, away uh, one from the other. Uh, or, yeah, harmonic uh, the ratio of the, of the cycles per second is in the ratio of four to three in order to get a fourth, a perfect fourth. Um, that note is, you know, if your strings are tuned uh, in, in these uh, very wide fifths of the just intonation system, um, that note is too large um, for the interval of a major sixth below. Major sixth uh, in the just intonation system uh, is again 14 cents flat um, from uh, from the tonic of that of that chord. Um, so it would have uh, yeah major six. Um, sorry. Yes, flat. Um, so, in order to be in tune with the upper string, you have to play the note high, and in order to be tuned down a, down the note, it has to be low. The distance your finger has to move is... 14 cents? 16 cents. Oh, 16 cents. 16 cents. Um, the fourth is actually two cents higher, but it sets a small interval. But yeah, that interval that you're moving, is uh, 16 cents that your finger has to move, um, which is a kind of a nice thing to figure out because then you actually can figure out how far does my finger have to 
have in terms of quote unquote wiggle room to play one intonation or, uh, versus the other intonation? Um, or one tonal area versus the other tonal area? Um, I guess for an example, it would be. Um, that fourth uh, is in tune with the A string, so I'm more in tune with keys that are in A. Um, but. Now says, okay, now I'm more in tune for a scale system that's in G. So then I would say, okay, well, what key am I in? You know, or what chord is this in, and what what scale would be the better system for me to use to play in tune for that E? Whether it's you know whether I'm playing with the piano, whether I'm playing with, with the string quartet or whatnot, I would then decide, okay, I need to use this this E or that E, the high E or the low E in order to figure out. Uh, yeah, because sometimes as well, especially when in quartet, I had to play against open E's, which is something I don't even, yeah, so it's something I don't even have entirely at all. So it's like, okay, I have to, you know, think uh, think on systems that I don't even have anything vibrating on my instrument for. Um, yeah, it gets a little complicated. Each each of them has, has, has their problems with it. Um, yeah. But that is, yeah, it's, and the, the amounts you're moving is 14 cents uh, to go from one to the other for those, you know, higher string to the lower string uh, kind of phenomenon. Uh, yeah. Wow, you're all brilliant. Great. <laughs> I love teaching brilliant people. <laughs> um, well, I'll just let to be here. Uh, you know, if there's any other further questions or concerns. Yeah. We can just end here, and if you have any more questions, feel free to talk to Mr. Peshika afterwards, and we'll be around. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you so much.